Amen. That's good. All right. Well, I want to kind of go back and, and continue on with what we've been talking about, reaching souls and reaching people. And in Matthew 9, 36, it says, When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. There are plenty of lost people out there. Plenty that are ready. He said there's not enough workers. So we pray for that. And also, let me tell you, we're the answer to that prayer. Amen? I so believe that. I so, as I pray, when I pray for somebody's relatives, I also realize I'm the answer for somebody else's relatives. I always think about that. Like when you bring in your family member, I'm, I'm loving them. Like I just want someone to love one of my family members that doesn't know Jesus yet. Amen? So just we are the answer to that prayer. And, and last time, a few weeks ago, we talked about Philip and Simon, Simon the sorcerer. And I, I believe he legitimately got saved. But ministry was messy. I mean, Peter shows up and, and, and Simon's all like, hey, can I buy that? Can I buy that gift so I can, you know, lay hands on people and they start talking in tongues? And Peter's like, what? And, you know, Peter kind of kind of rebuked him very strongly. And I can imagine him like, you know, you can imagine Peter being like looking at Phil like, dude, what? <laughs> he probably didn't. I don't know. But you could imagine it, right? Like, and, and, and you know what? I don't think Philip was embarrassed. Ministry's messy. Sometimes things don't, people are in process, right? And so we got to recognize that. We're going we're gonna to win souls. We're going to win this city. Sometimes things will be different. We might get some, some unusual people in here. They may have some unusual baggage. Amen. That's all right, man. Jesus is going to do it. Jesus is going to take care of it. I believe it. Amen? Amen. Now, we, we do get rid of our baggage. He, he doesn't call us to carry it forever. Because we're packing for heaven, and we don't need that junk for this trip. Amen? So today I want to talk about how God is, breaks down walls and barriers. And, and we're going to look at the, the conversion of Cornelius. And this is a good one. This is a good one. This one, the conversion of Cornelius in Acts is huge theological doctrinal impact. It really set the course for the church. It is a, one of our probably one of the most significant um, doctrinally conversions in the New Testament, right there with, with Paul. So listen, you're going to enjoy this. It's really good. Now, I just really love just looking through these conversions and seeing what God is saying and seeing what we can learn, and I'm just really enjoying this, this study. But uh, let's go ahead to Acts chapter 10. I'm going to read some of the verses and explain some because it's kind of a long whole chapter. So Acts chapter 10. We got on the, we'll have verses on there and a screen. And, and um, all right, so Cornelius, let me start with him. Cornelius, he's a centurion of the, it says, of the Italian regiment. And so that would have been, uh, or the Italian cohort, some translations will say. And so a cohort would have been about six groups called centuries. And they just say Italian because they were probably all from Italy. And so how many want to guess how, how many soldiers are in a centurion? A hundred. So, fun fact, you're kind of not wrong, but a little wrong, but you're right, because it should be a hundred, right? It used to be, but a little bit before the time of Christ, they started reducing the number to around 80 and never changed the name. So, kind of sounds like a very normal human thing. So, really of, of very little importance, but it'll give you some flex power when you're talking with your friend and you can be like, well, it's actually 80. I learned it in church. No, <laughs> just kidding. Don't be that way. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's a joke. So, but, uh, so one of the things that I read, which was really cool, is from an, uh, Flavius Vegetius. He's a, a writer from the early Roman era, from just New Testament era. I don't know if he was a vegetarian or if that was just his name. But he wrote some books about the military. And, he, and this is kind of significant because we really see this in Cornelius' character. 
Now it says centurion qualifications. It said he is to be vigilant, temperate, active, and readier to execute the orders he receives than to talk. Oh man, boy. We could just I could preach a whole sermon on that. <laughs> Amen. Amen. But Cornelius was what we would call in the scripture calls a God fearer. Okay? Kind of in a similar way as uh, the Ethiopian eunuch. So the significance is he was not a convert. He wasn't a Jewish convert. Uh, he wasn't a Christian, but he was a God-fearer. So it's kind of like, what does that even mean? Well, he was kind of warm to the gospel. He was kind of warm to things of Judaism, uh, a sympathizer. Uh, he shared some of the same values, uh, but hasn't really fully jumped in yet. He had not been converted, so he was doing some things like praying. He was giving alms. He was basically ripe fruit. And I love people who are, there are people that are God-fearers. Uh, there are people that are close to salvation. And you'll see some of these signs. So look, when we, when we talk about Cornelius, sometimes, and it doesn't always happen this way, but we see somebody there. You know somebody. You probably work with them. They, have, they hold the church in high regard. They hold believers in high regard. Not everybody does, right? But, but there are some that do that are not saved, and they have respect. Their experience with Christians has been good. Their experience is, you know, I, I don't believe, but I'm not anti, right? And sometimes they even hold some of the same values. They're not saved, but they are somebody that's kind of, you can see that fruit, it's looking like it's a little bit ripe. And so we have to kind of pay attention to that. And those are, those are my favorites. Those are my favorites because when you start sharing the gospel with them, they just absorb it. I remember one time I was sharing the gospel with this coworker way back, and I wasn't even in the mood to talk about it. Uh, you ever been there like that? I wasn't in the mood. I was like, ah. And I was like, you know, I felt the Holy Spirit tugging on me. And then I was like, all right. So I started talking to her and she asked a question. Okay, what about, what about this? I mean, she wanted to know everything. Noah's Ark, everything. And like every time I'd answer, she'd ask another question. <laughs> and so I was like, okay. And after a while, you know, I might be slow to get into the party, but I get there eventually, right? And, and so... I just kept going, and I started getting, you know, excited about it and sharing. And, and then finally, I was just like, do you, do you want to pray and receive Jesus right now? She's like, yeah. yeah and there's, there's people like that, and we have to be sensitive to those people, discerning and ready, because they're ready. They're seekers. And that's, that's some ripe fruit we've got to be ready to pick. All right, so let's go ahead to Acts chapter 10, verse 1. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort, a devout man who feared God with all his household, gave alms generously to the people, and prayed continually to God. About the ninth hour of the day, so that would have been 3 o'clock, that would have been the Jewish time of prayer, so he was praying with them. He saw clearly in a vision an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius, and he stared at him in terror, and he said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon who is called Peter. He is lodging with one Simon the Tanner whose house is by the sea. And when the angel who spoke to him had departed, he called out two of his servants, a devout soldier from among those who attended him. And having related everything to them, he sent them on to Joppa. All right, so... One thing that we see here already is he didn't ask a lot of questions. He's just like, okay, and right away, like that same day. Now, that's a little late to start a long road trip in Bible times. You don't normally start at 3 o'clock, or maybe by then it's 4 o'clock. That's pretty late. But he's like, guys, let's go now. And he sent off a devout soldier, which probably was somebody that had same kind of leanings as him probably was not just devoted to his leader, but kind of the implication there is that that soldier was also somebody who was a God-fearer. And so, and some servants, and they went, and he sent them on their way right away. Now, Peter, he's over at Simon the Tanner's house in Joppa. Now, Tanner, that's somebody who deals with leather, skins, animal skins. And so that was kind of interesting to me is 
he also would have been somebody that was unclean a lot. So this is almost a little bit of foreshadowing here. And so Simon the Tanner, because of his job handling dead carcasses all the time, would not be able to participate unless he went through the whole ritual cleansing in a lot of the Jewish things. A lot of clean people couldn't associate with him too much because he was unclean, unclean, right? Good thing we don't have that anymore these days, right? I think sometimes we might. Sometimes some people, we treat them as unclean. But I'm jumping ahead of myself, aren't I? (laughs) So he would have been making things like shoes and sandals and belts and anything to do with leather. So Peter's staying at his house. You know, they have the flat roofs. And so Peter's on the roof. It's around lunchtime. Peter's kind of hanging out, praying a little bit. And then he he falls into this trance and he, he has this vision. And he sees what looks like maybe like a sheet or some big white thing full of animals, clean and unclean. So there's like snakes and birds and lambs and a little bit of everything. It's, they're all coming down. And the Lord says to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And so let's go ahead to verse 13. And, and there came a voice to him and said, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said... By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice came to him again a second time. He said, what God has made clean, do not call common. And this happened three times, and the thing was taken up to heaven at once. So Peter's kind of perplexed by this. He doesn't fully grasp yet all of the significance. He's like, don't call anything that God has cleansed unclean. So, we, you know, we believe this is why we can eat lobster and bacon and, oh, fasting. We're fasting. Stop talking about food. I just, I just want you to know, I realize as a pastor, I talk about food too much in sermons. Don't talk about food when it's getting to lunchtime, right? But uh, anyway, I digress. So Peter's perplexed. He doesn't fully understand the ramifications of it. And while he's thinking about it, Knock on the door. Cornelius' people show up, and they're knocking on the door. And so he goes down. He's like, what can, I, what can I do for you guys? And so they tell Peter about the vision. And so next, the next day, they all head off to Caesarea, and they get there, and the house is full. So Cornelius has filled the house. His family's there. His servants are there. His friends are there. And Cornelius made good money. I think it was, I think the centurions would make uh, six times what a regular soldier would make. It's around around that. So that's pretty good. How many want to make six times what you're making right now? (laughs) That'd be all right. So he's got probably a big house. So if the house is full, there's a lot of people there, right? And so he gets there and, and, and Cornelius falls down, tries to worship Peter. Peter's like, no, I'm a guy like you. Don't worship me. You know, it's not about us, right? It's not about us. You've got to remember that. It's about Jesus. Not about how smart or anointed we are or whatever. Keep that focus on him. And so then Peter starts to, starts to preach. And, and, well, he says this before that. He says in verse 28, because this is significant. He said to them, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or visit anyone of another nation. He's like, we, we don't. I, he's like, I don't have any Gentile friends. I don't have any friends like you, of your kind. Hello? Yeah. And he says, but God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. Amen. So he got it. He's like, I get it now. I get what you meant with the animals. It's not just about having the lobster buffet. This is about people. He said, I'm not to call anybody common or unclean. Okay? And then he starts to preach Jesus. And he goes through it. He talks about Jesus, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And then in verse 43, he says this, To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Right there, that's, I mean, this is, this is where it hits. Because that's, 
He's, he's finished, but he don't know he's finished yet <laughs> because the Holy Spirit falls on them and they all start speaking in tongues and he hasn't even had his altar call yet. God moves in a supernatural way. And so, but you know, he finished the gospel message right there. Jesus is God. Jesus died on the cross, paid the price for my sins, rose from the grave, conquering death, sin, and hell. And through faith in him, I am saved and forgiven of my sins. There you go. The gospel message right there. And verse 44, while Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised, those are the ones who like, they're like they want everyone to follow the Old Testament rules. They want everyone to be converted to Judaism first, then to Christianity, who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles, for they were hearing them speak in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter declared, can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they asked him to remain with them some days. Wow. Honestly, full, full transparency, I was working on my message this week, I think like Friday, and I was reading this, and he says, can anyone forbid water that they be baptized? And Ryan and I were talking, we're like, yeah, you know, normally if someone wants to get baptized, I say, you know, let's wait a couple weeks, and then, you know, I mean, let's, let's schedule it a couple weeks and see if anyone else wants to join us. That's not, that's not wrong. That's Okay. He's like, well, I might be going out of town for a little bit. I'll be back in a few months. And then, you know, I was like, okay, well, we could do it back. We could do it then. And the Holy Spirit, I'm, I'm, I'm getting ready. And I'm like, I'm working on my sermon. He says, can anyone forbid them water to be baptized? I just felt like the Holy Spirit would be like, nope. Amen? Amen. So I'm like, hey, you want to do it this, you want to do it this week? He's like, yeah, man, let's go for it. He goes, that's initially what I wanted to do. And I'm like, oh, man, Jesus, do not let me get in the way. Amen? Amen? Amen. I'm telling you, let's be that kind of people. who will be like, yep, yes, Lord. I love that about Cornelius. He speaks to him, and he's like, yep, okay, right now, let's go. He wasn't even saved yet. That's pretty great. Man, I, I... I, I, I'm telling you, man, I want Jesus to be looking around. Oh, send, just send him to Gateway. He'd be like with his angels. You know, this is all not doctrinal. He, he'd be like with his angels. Uh, send him to Gateway. They always be baptizing people over there. That's right. Amen? amen. Just give me enough time to fill the tank. And if you want warm water, let me know. It takes like about four hours to warm it. We, get, we, we were able to warm it three hours, so Ryan, we're working on it. You did better than the last group. They had no heat. So, but uh, praise the Lord. All right, so a couple of things I want to point out in what we see here with Cornelius. One that I've said a lot of times, and I want to say it like a million times, is God loves saving families. He loves it. He does it. He's good at it. Write it down. Remember it. Pray it. Believe it. Get a tattoo of it. God's saving my family. I mean, you're like, what? No, no. Don't, I, I just have, don't worry. I'm, don't say you have to get a real tattoo. You can get one of those fake ones if you want. Point is, believe it. Pray like it's true. Love everybody else's family member like they're your own. Sow those seeds. Amen? And bring them in. Bring them in. Bring them in, because this is going to be the place where when you bring your family members, we're going to be like, woohoo, welcome. We love you. We're glad you're here. Amen? Amen. Amen. I just want to be like that more and more. I tell you, man, I get so excited when I see Marcus or some of your other family members that come in here, and I'm just like, woo, I get so excited. Anyway, anyway, so believe that. Another thing I want to point out, this, this is kind of something we probably all know. But nice people need Jesus, Amen. right? Not just everybody that's all a big mess. They need Jesus, too. He saves them, too. But the one we're looking at today is Cornelius. He's a pretty great guy. He's a man of courage. He's a soldier who, who's earned his way up there in the ranks. 
I know some pastors were telling me they love having former military people serving in the church because they just they just follow orders. <laughs> they know how to do it. They're like, yes, sir. And they get things done and they work hard. And, you know, and Rick's like one of those guys. Rick was the Marine. So, you know, I love that. You know, he's like, all right, let's do this, this. And he's like, yes, sir, let's go. Let's get her done. You know, that was, that was Cornelius. He was a man of action. He was a leader. He had leadership qualities. He led his family well because they were all right there with him. He, he, he had all of them as God-fearers as well. His friends, he had a lot of respect with his friends. He was a giver. He gave alms to the poor. He had a good reputation among the Jewish community. I'll tell you what, he's, he's better than, than some church people. Not at this church, you know, the other church, first church. You know, I mean, he's good. We put him on the church council. Right? You know, I mean, he had all these great qualifications. But you know what? He still needed Jesus. Our nice friends who are so sweet, they still need Jesus. And sometimes what we don't realize is they are embracing some things of God but have not yet embraced Jesus. Don't assume that they are okay, and don't assume that they're not going to receive just because they have some things together in their life. Amen. Yep, because a lot of them are ready. Amen? Amen? You know, some people are more ready to receive Jesus than we're ready to tell them. That was like me with that girl. I was like, I was not in the mood for it. I was at work. I was tired. I was trying to, I was trying to, like, kind of take off on my own. You know, we had downtime. We did this job, and we were, um, this was way back when I was working at Disney. We had, like, two hours. They said, just hang out for two hours and then clock out. I was like, I love that. And so I was, like, trying to get, you know, take off, and she kept asking me questions, and finally I caught on. But sometimes these people, they're more ready than we are. Remember those qualifications? It said he was, for a soldier, is readier to execute orders he receives than to talk about them. Oh, man. Yeah, Jesus was, you know. And so Cornelius, he obeyed right away that same day, and he sent them on their way. He's like, yep, let's do it. I'm ready. He had all his friends ready. He's like, well, this is going to be important. Come on over, friends. Get my family ready. He filled his house because he was so ready. But watch this. And, and, and then, well, and then, you know, even before Peter could get to, like, every head bowed, every eyes closed, you know, if you want to accept Jesus today, just no one's looking around. Just slip your hand up and put it back down just really quick. And then the pastor does this. He goes, I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that. He's just pointing at the same hand. Just kidding. It's a joke. It's a pastor joke. And, and, and listen, you know, I mean, I don't, seriously, like, if I might do it one day if I feel led to have everyone bow their heads. Sometimes I'm like, man, just lift your head up, look around, and come on down. It's a little more scary. But sometimes I've done it that way, too. But. He didn't, he didn't do neither of those because they were so ready, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, and they were born again right there. Right? Because you can't be filled with the Holy Spirit without being born again. They believed. They're like, yeah, we believe that. They didn't say a prayer out like in a normal way. They just said, we're like, we believe, and the Holy Spirit showed up. And he's like, let's baptize them. They were ready. But watch this. Acts 10, 14. So God gave a vision to a very similar vision. It was an angelic visitation. God said, hey, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter said, by no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice said to him a second time, what God has made clean, do not call common. See, I got this good idea. You ready? You might want to write this down. All right, you ready? Don't use these two words in the same sentence. No and Lord. Lord 
He's like, not so, Lord. Not so, no, Lord. Because I... Because Lord means in charge, the boss, the king, the one I follow. And no means, nah. <laughs> right? Let's, use, let's put those in somewhere else. Say, Lord, I don't understand. Lord, this, this is different from what I understood. Show me how this is biblical. Because it's all there. We got it. Jesus set it up. Jesus teed it up. Jesus talked about going to the uttermost parts of the world. It was, it was there. But his initial response was, I don't know about this, Lord. Man, we've all done that, right? We've all done that. Peter didn't, Peter's not a bad guy. That's just what happened. Because he got on board. He's like, okay. Because God's like, I have made this clean. Do not call them common. Amen? Amen? Let us sink in. See, because Peter has his, had his preconceived ideas. It wasn't just about food. Nobody was, nobody was really doing this yet. We had the Ethiopian get saved. But really, on a whole, uh, even in, in chapter 11, it says in verse 19, they were scattered and the persecution. And the last part, it says, they were speaking the word to no one except for Jews. That was just what they were doing. They were doing what they knew to do, but they weren't going to anybody, anybody else. But Peter got on board. He did. He got there. It took him a minute. I love that. I love that because I'm definitely one of those people who maybe you don't, it doesn't seem that way, but it, sometimes it takes me a minute. God's like, hey, this. And I'm like, yeah, what? <laughs> But man, world changers, they get on board. You know, one time I remember I was, I was watching a news thing about, I think, I forget what country it was, maybe Afghanistan, Syria, and there was Christians fleeing from the, from the terrorists. And they were all running up on top of a mountain. And helicopters were coming in trying to take a few of them away and rescue them. And the terrorists were surrounded. It was like like minutes from death. And they had a news reporter in a helicopter, and he saw the family jump on board. And I, and I saw like a teenage girl, and she's like crying, and just like her face. And I was like, whoa, I was struck. And I was like, we got to do something to help these people. I'm, I'm, and so I contacted a relief agency that was helping refugees. And I said... I said, hey, I said, I saw this video and I saw this and these Christian refugees coming. And I said, I want to help. Our church wants to help some of these refugees, these Christian refugees coming from the Middle East. And she said, well, we definitely can use help. But um, we have families coming in, but um, we don't have any Christian families. They're all Muslim would you be willing to help one of them? And that wasn't what I was aiming for. Because I had wanted to help these families that were my brothers and sisters. I said, I don't have any. Will you help a Muslim family? And I just felt like the Holy Spirit just be like, Phew. and I just started to cry. And I was like, yes. And she's crying on the other line. And we're just both crying. And I'm like, yeah. And we met some really great families that we were able to help and do things and we even brought a Thanksgiving meal to one of them and just heard their stories they all just so you know they all have a story to tell and a lot of them have had some real trials and they and he said we were at our house the terrorists came in said said uh, this is our house now get out with a gun AK they all had to leave. His son was very, very chronically ill. He could, could not eat food, so he had to buy a special formula. And so he had to sell his truck to pay for the formula. Tara said, come back later. We might give you your house back. Went back later. said, now nah, we're keeping it. And they said to him, hey, you know what? He said, but my family. He said, leave your family. Come and fight with us. And, and, and he and, he, and like, he's like, oh, my family, he's, Allah will give you a new family. And so he's like, he didn't want to leave his family. And he said this to me. He goes, 
I didn't want to kill, and I didn't want to die, so we ran. And then they found their way here. You know, and, and uh, man, when we, sh- when we shared that Thanksgiving with them, it was so cool. It was so cool. And he just was, he told us how he, back before the war, he used to go to the Christian settlements and Christmas and see the Christmas lights with his kids. And I'm like, there's a lot we don't know, my friends. God said, don't call them common or unclean. And he said it before they were born again. He's done this cleansing. They're not saved yet. But he's saying, don't call them unclean. Don't treat them as unclean. I was like, wow. Praise the Lord. Amen? So, the huge impact here is that this is a brand new day for the Gentiles. I mean, we'd started to see it. The Ethiopian got saved. Jesus ministered to Gentiles. He ministered ministered to a centurion and and to Samaritans and, and people outside of the Jewish faith. But this is where it really starts to take hold, where it really starts to become a reality. The Gentiles do not have to follow the Old Testament uh, uh, ceremonial laws, right? Colossians 2.16 says, Let's, Therefore let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food or drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of things to come, but Christ, is, the substance belongs to Christ. See, what was happening is God was breaking down all the walls. He's breaking down all the barriers. Let me tell you something. When he breaks down these walls, yeah, it's, it's about the wall between us and him for sure, right? The curtain whoosh, ripped in half. We have access before the throne of grace. But you know what? He has broken down the walls between us, between the Christians and the Muslims, between the whites and the blacks, between the Republicans and the Democrats. We should not have those walls of division between us because Jesus did not put them there. He takes them down. Do I vote in a certain way? Yeah, but I love Jesus more than my vote, and I love you more than my vote. Amen? Yeah, you can clap for that because that's good. But in, in, in the temple... Remember they had the courtyard of the Gentiles was where they had the flea market and Jesus whipped them and took them out and then they had this wall and then everyone else could go in closer to that and they had this sign up there. I think we have it for the screen. They had this sign and it said, it said uh, no foreigner is to enter within the balustrade and forecourt around the sacred precinct. Whoever is caught will himself be responsible for his consequent death. Where's the, uh, you got it up there? There we go. Put up my little thing there. What are you doing? You're not on Facebook, are you? <laughs> I Googled it. I Googled this. I want you to see the little, little, there it is. See. So they discovered that 150 years ago, this ancient inscription. And basically, this was part of the dividing wall between the Jews and the Gentiles. And they said, you're going to die if you go through here. But Jesus died so that we could. Amen? Amen. Ephesians 2.13 says it this way, and this is great. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who has made us both one. Talking about Jews and Gentiles. And has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. That's that dividing wall. By abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man, one new person in the place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he brings us together. And to Jesus, we become united together in Christ to go to Christ together. That's what he's about. Amen? Amen. 
Galatians 3.28 says this. It says, There is neither Jew nor Greek nor slave nor free. There is no male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen? So we don't, we tear down walls between each other and barriers between each other, preconceived notions, whatever. I'm not saying that, like, people that are unsaved, they need to repent and receive Jesus. I'm not saying that. I'm not a Unitarian. They need to see, they need Jesus. But you know what? I don't treat them as unclean. I treat them as chosen. Jesus wants to bring them into the kingdom, and we become united together. He wants to break down those walls, whatever those are, so we can come together, connect to Jesus. And God will lead us out of what we're comfortable with. I saw this great video, and this, this guy, this African-American man, I forget how it started, but he met this white guy that was like, like you know, total racist, KKK guy. And instead of being mad at him, which he'd have every right to be, right? He was a believer. He went and became his friend and started talking to him, found out the kid was all messed up, became like a father figure to him. Guy got set free from his racism and born again, and they became lifelong friends. Mm. That's my Jesus. It's kind of like what he did for us, isn't it? Amen? Amen. Acts 10, 28 says this, But God has chosen, has shown me, that I should not call any person common or unclean. He wants to save families. He wants us to look for people, that ripe fruit, those God-fearers that are ready, open to the gospel. And listen, they might be more ready than we are, but we can lift up our eyes and be like, you know what, I'm going to be ready. Someone wants to be baptized, let's do it. They, they, they want, you know what? I don't know how to lead someone to the Lord. I'm going to go find out. So I'm ready to pray that prayer. Like that centurion creed, readier to e- execute orders he receives than to talk. Oh, man, I love that. Isn't that good? Ready to follow orders than to just talk about them. Well, you know, Lord, if we're... Yes, sir. Amen. Let's stand. God is doing a lot behind the scenes. You know, sometimes he's moving these angels and doing these things like he was with Cornelius and Peter, and we don't even see it. I'm going to have the the altar workers come forward. If you'd come forward for anybody that needs prayer. And I I don't know. I'll give an opportunity here. If there's anybody here, you don't know Jesus. And you want to pray and receive Jesus, just raise your hand. I'll give you a, a minute. I don't see anybody that I know of, but I'll give you a minute. Or anybody that wants to rededicate their life to Jesus. Is there anybody here who wants to rededicate their life to Jesus? Lord, okay. Well, praise the Lord. That's, we, let's get some more in here. Amen? Let's get some more in. Lord, I just thank you for what you did for us that you broke down the big wall between us and you, but you broke down all walls between us and everybody else. May we have that heart. Lord, use us to reach the Corneliuses out there and all of their family members. And Lord, may we see your kingdom expanded and growing. And Lord, just give you glory. And we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. Thank you for what you've done. I just bless each person here. I just pray your anointing on them and use us to shine your light and to share your love with others. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord.